All right, folks, welcome back to Dominions 5. We are doing a, a slightly different thing. Uh, I'm starting a new game soon. I'm actually start, The game is actually starting in the next few days. Videos for it will start to go up probably in the next, like, three weeks or so, depending on how quickly it takes us to get to turn, you know, turn 15, 20 like normal. This game will be different because this will be a modded game. Uh, a buddy of mine, uh, Herdalas, who has made a number of mods for different nations, many of them based off of video games, will be other video games that is, uh, wants to test out his mods. So he's made a mod compilation and he's kind of put them all together and we will be using them in a middle age game. So he's got some early age, some late age, some middle age nations all sort of crammed together and we're going to see how they balance against each other and against the uh, base nations. So we've got the mods down here. Aurum the Golden Republic. I'm actually not sure if that one is here to last or if that is one another one that somebody else wanted to do. We've also got Anorlando, Dranglake, Lothric, Skyrim, and Hallownest, the City of Tears. And Hallownest is the nation that I will be playing. So I'm not going to talk about my strategy specifically in this video, but I am going to talk about Hallownest. Um, and all of these sprites were made by Herdalas, all of the special mechanics and spells and all that stuff, all very cool stuff. If you've ever played the game Hollow Knight, that, that's what Hallownest is based off of. This is based off the world of that game. So if you haven't finished the game, minor spoilers. Um, I'm not, not going to ruin the whole, uh, the whole thing for you, but some of this stuff will be very, very familiar. So, Hallownest has... Uh, well, let's kind of go through it. Hallownest basically has the interesting the interesting quality that none of their units wear armor and most of their units have pretty significant natural protection so on the one hand that makes them on the one hand that's kind of useful for commanders because it means you can layer armor over their natural protection for troops it's interesting because it means they have decent protection or okay protection at least but um it's hard to buff because like legions of steel does nothing to them or almost nothing because the only armor they have is at most a shield um iron skin is less effective than it would be for most people because their protection already comes from nat prod and so iron skin can only boost that up to 20. so it's an interesting interesting situation uh they do have national spies and they're just priced like regular spies they're called pathfinders obviously you know the character this is based off if you've ever played the game um they're stealthy, they have all the survivals, which is very, very cool, actually. They have literally all of the survivals. They are animals, and this is a common feature. All of Hallownest's units are animals. Almost all of Hallownest's units have low magic resistance. Their base magic resistance is 8, which is actually worse than Ulm's, if I recall correctly. If I recall correctly, early age Ulm is 9 average. Where'd Ulm go? Uh, hmm, there it is. Nope, eight, same as all. So yeah, it's not good. Um, you're very, very vulnerable to magic resistance negates spells. Where'd I go? There, Hellenist City of Tears. Um, and that's just true of all your troops, like all of them. You don't, you don't have another option. Your commanders are not that vulnerable, but your troops very, very much are, and it can become a serious problem. Uh, you've got the Hellenist Sentry troop-wise. Well, we'll get to troops in a minute. You've got these Hollow Nest Captains, which have a Castle Defense bonus and can fly, and they have a Lance, the Nail Lance, which has a Charge bonus for the first strike. Um, the Charge bonus is limited to, I think, 5 or 6, based on their strength, uh, so they hit for about 20 damage on the first the first round of combat. 20 piercing damage is pretty solid. It's nothing super, super special. The Hollow Nest Devout, these are just level 1 Priests, and they are your only Priests. You don't have any other priests other than this guy. None of your other commanders are priests. None of your uh, none of your units are sacred. However, a number of your commanders are sacred. In fact, most of them. So you have this interesting dichotomy where, on the one hand, you have a lot of sacred commanders, but on the other hand, you only have one priest, and it's kind of shit for blessing purposes. So it's an interesting situation. Now, the Hellenus priest is the Hellenus devout. Sorry, is a level forty leader. So you could theoretically lead expansion parties with these guys. Um, but, of course, as I said, you have no sacred troops. So there's no real reason to do that. Your first actual mage, and to my mind, probably the most commonly valuable, is the Snail Shaman. Snail Shaman, 175 gold for three paths, which is not too expensive. That's perfectly reasonable. One fire, one water, and then you get either fire or water. So you either have fire two, water one, or fire one, water two. Um, research, 
not terribly impressive for the price, but they are sacred. So their upkeep cost is only 70 gold a year. So they do build up at effective cost, at effective uh, upkeep cost. They're just, you know, expensive up front. And once again, they are animals and their magic resistance is a little bit lower than most mages. Most mages have like 14, 15, they have 13. However, they are leaders. So they can, this is a mage that can lead troops, which means you can just pump out snail shamans and ignore your basic commander. There's no reason to, to recruit Hallownest captains really ever. The Soul Twister is your capital only mage, and the Soul Twister is very interesting because it's an extremely powerful astral mage. It can be astral four natively, or it can have one of these randoms. So you can, if necessary, form communions. However, uh, they're not necessary, basically. Um, the only reason you would communion is to cast death spells, higher level death spells, and uh, to my thinking, that's not really valuable enough to justify it. So the Soul Twisters are capital only. They're powerful astral mages. You can cast anti-magic right off the bat. You can cast a spell right off the bat. You can forge the, um, once you get up high enough in construction, you can forge the Starshine Skullcap to boost up to astral five natively. So you have a ton of astral access. Uh, also, your Snail Shamans, once you, if you get a, uh, a fire random, can forge a water bracelet and then they can forge rune smashers for you to increase your spell penetration which is very useful to put rune smashers on soul twisters in order to give their astral spells better pen you then have two uh terrain dependent mages that are the mountain shaman and the forest shaman the mountain shaman has earth one and randoms either earth or astral so you can get crystal magic from them and you can get earth communions so if you do form communions mountain shamans are probably going to be your communion slaves the Forest Shaman has Nature and Death and can get Nature 2. That's also very, very valuable. Nature 2 especially is very valuable because it unlocks the good Nature Forging options. Um, the Rings of Regeneration, the Amulet of uh, Resilience, and of course the uh, Thistle Mace, which you can use to boost up to Nature 3. So Forest Shamans are extremely valuable for you. In terms of troops, there are two troops that are most important to my mind. You have a size 4 Trampler, who is not very impressive, but they are cheap. 35 gold, size 4 Trampler, low defense, fairly low protection. They die very quickly, but they will trample in the process. You've got these Moss Knights, which are a terrain recruit. Um, they're okay. They've got a high defense skill. And this is, once again, common across the Hallow Nest roster. Hallow Nest troops have high defense skills because they're not wearing armor. So they don't take the armor defense penalty that almost everybody normally takes. So these Moss Knights, they have only prot 8, but they have high hit points and they have a defense skill 15, which means they're actually shockingly resilient. They also have a little bit of fire resistance, which is kind of cool. Now, these are the two units that really matter. You have the Warrior Bug, first of all. The Warrior Bug is size 1, has a very mediocre attack, costs only 9 gold and 3 resources and 6 recruitment points, so significantly less than a normal human, and has defense skill 15. In other words, the Warrior Bug is God's perfect chaff. Um, you can pump out a ton of these guys with no problems whatsoever, and you can just use them to fill spaces. And in that context, where none of them are taking more than like maybe one attack per turn, they last a really, really long time. Um, this, this description here seems to make them like look bad. They are not. They are really, really good. Especially because you have Mountain Shamans. And Mountain Shamans with the Earth Random can cast Earth Power and then can cast Strength of Giants. And you, if you drop Strength of Giants on Warrior Bugs, all of a sudden their attack goes from very mediocre to, to like pretty solidly moderately effective. And when you have six of them per square, a solidly moderately effective attack becomes very, very dangerous very, very quickly. So they're really handy. The other one is the Great Sentry. This is your capital only unit low resource cost, moderate recruitment points, pretty expensive in gold, but protection 16, defense skill 18, hits for 26 damage, and has an enormous shield, so they have a great parry. So in other words, and, and just natural 16 protection. So in other words, great sentries don't die because they have 40 freaking hit points on top of their very, very good defensive skills. I mean, in terms of stats, Great sentries are objectively better than pretty much any heavy cavalry, and they're a good bit cheaper, especially in recruitment points and resources. That being so, great sentries are your killing power, and a few great sentries 
mixed into a big pile of warrior bugs basically means it makes for an army that doesn't stop because the warrior bugs um hold stop the enemy take a couple of casualties then the great sentries start killing them and the great sentries will kill a human at basically every swing um what that means is the great sentries will rack up experience rapidly the warrior bugs will also rack up experience which will push their defense skill even higher and make them even better chaff so expansion wise those guys are great other options you have the howl nest sentry who has a castle defense bonus and that's the only important thing about them you have the howl nest lancer who can fly it has a lance so they get that 20 damage initial strike which is pretty useful also have a, a castle defense bonus so these guys are actually really good at siege defense almost two each and you have the Minor Bug, who has an enormous Siege bonus, and so gives 5.5 Siege Strength each. Expensive, but if you're looking to knock down walls, having some Minor Bugs with you is a great idea. So those are your troops. These are the important ones. Warrior Bug, Great Sentry, occasionally Halonist Lancer, occasionally Minor Bug. Moss Knights aren't bad. Um, I would never recruit Halonist Sentries, they're not worth it. And I wouldn't really bother to recruit Great Stags unless you have literally nothing else you need to do. In terms of Commanders, your Snail Shamans are actually surprisingly useful, mainly because they can forge Rune Smashers, uh, half of them can throw Fireballs and summon Fire Elementals, the other half have Water 2, Fire 1, and so can summon Green Lions. Once you hit that level of research, you can cast Manifest Vitriol with these guys, and since half of them have Water 2, you can Sight Search to build up Water Gem income and not really spend it until then. And then you can summon a ton of Green Lions to back up your, your troops. And of course, since your troops don't actually use armor, except for occasionally shields, um, a few acid splashes landing in your lines doesn't bother you all that much. In terms of sites, you start off with three water gems per turn, and have great sentry recruitment at that site. You have one death gem per turn, and you have two astral pearls per turn, plus recruitment of the soul twister. Um, soul twisters are good, but you're going to recruit them in limited quantities mainly they're capital only mainly you're going to be pumping out snail shamans and you're going to try to get forts on terrain as quickly as you can especially on forests forest shamans are really good i mean don't get me wrong mountain shamans are good mountain shamans are valuable especially because you have the paths to forge the boosters for both earth and astral so an astral random here can put on a pair of earth boots put on a starshine skull cap and then can forge um all the crystal gear you could ever want including crystal shields and stuff i think no, Crystal Shields, I think, take Earth 3, so you'd have to boost one more through some other method. But they can do a lot of valuable forging for you. Um, in general, you're going to have a lot of Snail Shamans of all types. Um, I would focus on the Forest ones, though, for the nature, and I'll talk about why that is here in just a second. There are two National Pretender chassis. The Pale King, who is a Rainbow Chassis, chassis with... Astral 1, Death 1. Unfortunately, currently the Pale King is a strictly worse version of the Demi-Lich. Um, he has this magical, this this pure nail attack. It's not even magical, actually. He has a pure nail attack and good stats, but you never want him in combat anyway. And uh, the Demi-Lich is 20 points cheaper and has an extra point of Dominion, so the Demi-Lich is actually cheaper for anything you really want to do. Um, the only thing the Pale King has is that he's mobile, but then he's not immortal. So I would pick the Demi Lich over the Pale King always. However, the other chassis is a very interesting one, the Radiance. The Radiance is expensive, but has a combination of very, very interesting qualities. 15 in vulnerability, awe, ethereal, and flying. For attacks, he's got a an AP melee attack. And then he's got a very long-ranged AoE armor-piercing flame attack that is also used in melee. <clears throat> so the Radiance is actually a really good expander. Now, the paths are Astral and Fire, which aren't terribly exciting, but when it comes to expansion, the Radiance is honestly a really good option. And in fact, because it also has slots, it doesn't have arms, but he has body, head, feet, and two miscellaneous slots, you can turn the Radiance into a supercaster in the late game, where you can pop him into a battlefield, be fairly confident he's not going to die, and drop a number of spells with him. Plus, with High Astral, he can do things like cast Returning if he ever gets in trouble. He can. Uh, there's ways for him to avoid death, which is good because he's also not immortal. In general, I would probably take the... I, I don't know. You can take the Radiance or the Demi-Lich. Your other options are fairly uninspiring. 
Um, I wouldn't really bother with most of them, possibly an oracle or a fountain of blood if you had a real specific bless idea. But wait, you say, why would you have a bless idea? You have these sacred commanders, sure, but you don't have hardly any priests, so it's going to be kind of a pain in the neck blessing them up. I'm glad you asked, because there are a couple of national spells that Hollow Nest has that are very, very important. The first is Imbue Soul Warrior, which summons a Soul Warrior commander, and the second is Thaumaturgy 6 Create Vessel. That is a death astral cross path spell which you cannot nationally cast you need to get a hero there's a specific hero that can cast this spell um it's a multi-hero so you have the chance to get him multiple times and it summons a hollow knight and these two are very very interesting so let's pop over to the mod inspector and we'll take a look at them okay so uh, the, the sprites are not showing because the mod inspector doesn't handle mod sprites well, funnily enough, but these are the two, the two, uh, summons here. So first, the soul warrior. The soul warrior has 30 hit points, decent natural protection, that's all nat prod, decent magic resistance, very, very good combat stats, and is an astral two mage that teleports, and has map move 18. In other words, it doesn't have to move between provinces, it just teleports to wherever it wants to go. That's incredibly powerful. And of course, like I said, it's an astral mage. Um, you can forge shrouds for the soul warriors to give them your bless. So if you carry a powerful blessing, you can put a shroud on the soul warrior. It doesn't hurt at all because their protection is entirely natural protection. So the shroud just adds on nine body protection. They have the pure nail, which is a fairly effective weapon. Um, and of course you can upgrade that with magical weapons. These guys are great. You can turn them into very effective thugs, especially because they can teleport, and teleporting works in battle too. So they don't even have to fly, they just zap over to wherever it is that they want to be and murder a guy. Um, you can gear them out to be thugs, you can use them as casters, in the same way that a lot of people use golems um, for their astral magic. Uh, they're hugely, hugely useful, and because they have 30 hit points and 17 defense skill, and decent protection, they're also very durable. So, I mean, there's a lot of options for how to gear these people out because you have access to all the best gear paths. You have access to earth, to astral, nature, a little bit of death, not a whole lot of death. You've got fire on water so you can forge brands and shields and stuff. Uh, incredibly valuable. The other one is the Hollow Knight. And the Hollow Knight is a fascinating little unit because it starts off pathetic. The Hollow Knight starts off size one, 10 hit points, mediocre skills, no magic whatsoever. After hitting 15 experience, it turns into this. More hit points, a little bit more prot, uh, and now it has astral 1, death 1, see, 3 minus 2. And then when it hits 50 experience, that's 2 stars, it turns into this one, which has 18 hit points and more prot and more magic resistance and better skills, and is Astral 2, Death 2. And then after 100 experience, it turns into this one, which has over 20 hit points, Magic Resistance 20, Morale 50 instead of 30. All of them have 30 morale, by the way. They're unbreakable. Better skills yet, 3 Astral, 3 Death. Oh, and did I forget to mention? Every single one of them is immortal. They don't die. They're a National Immortal Summon for 26 gems. They're very, very good. Um, on top of this, at highest level, Hollow Knights become mindless, which means they are then immune to most of the astral attack spells. And they're also immune to Enslave Mind. So, if you get these guys up to maximum experience, if you get them over 100 experience, they become killing machines. Like, uh, at, at, at 50 experience, a Hollow Knight is as good as any Wraith Lord, because it has one fewer point of death, but it also has Astral. At 100 experience, Hollow Knights are objectively better than Wraith Lords, because they not only have the three death immortal, they also have the Astral, and they are sacred. They're all sacred, which means that you can give them a vial of holy water, which you can forge with your national water mages, and they can carry your bless. So Hollow Nest is in this very interesting situation, where on the one hand, a bless early on, like it wants a mage bless if anything, because early on their blessing doesn't really do anything, you can give it to your mages but no troops. But really, 
Really what Hollow Nest wants is a Thug Bless, because they have these summonable thugs, which are very, very effective, and would be much more effective yet with a blessing on them. So it's an interesting, it's an interesting thing to contemplate, especially because like, looking at Hollow Nest, what I immediately say is, oh, Hollow Nest wants a hard skin bless. Because once again, all of this is natural protection, so hard skin stacks perfectly with their nap prod. So if you put hard skin on a soul warrior, he has protection 19 out of the box. And then you put a suit of like armor of knights or something on him, and now he's protection, or well, you can't do that because he has to have the shroud, but you know what I mean. You put some, or the hollow knight. He has protection 14 in his final form. With hard skin, he's 19. Then you stack an armor of knights on top of that. Well, now he's around 30. Now he's really hard to kill. <clears throat> and of course, if he does die, he just comes back. He's immortal. Um, and he has, uh, I forgot to mention, the hollow knights all have uh, immunity to afflictions. They can't be injured permanently. The afflictions just don't work on them. So they're hilariously durable. You just have to kind of get them over the hump of being useless in the first two forms. You have to get them 50 experience. If you can get them 50 experience, they become amazing. Uh, if you get them 15 experience, they become usable. Before that, they're weak. And you have to kind of babysit them a little bit through the first 15 experience. Um, so what I would probably do is, like, this is a nation where I would probably forge champion skulls. Just forge a couple champion skulls, hand one to hollow knights. Don't really use them until they hit their uh, their second form. And once they hit their second form, you can take the gear away and start suiciding them to gain experience. But it's, it's like I said, it's a very interesting situation. So, I mean, on the one hand, you want to take a Radiance, because the Radiance can expand really well. But on the other hand, on the other hand, you kind of want a Bless chassis. So you kind of want, like, the Demi Lich. And then if you do that, you can take, like, a Dormant Demi Lich, or even an Imprisoned Demi Lich. Well, probably just Dormant, because you want to be able to start casting the spell as quickly as you can. Um... Take that so that you can actually cast the spell with your Demi Lich. Take Earth. What else? Uh, take a Regen Bless. You know, with that, and then you can go Heat 3. Uh, you don't actually want to go Misfortune on Hollow Nest, but you can easily tank Sloth and take like a point down of Turmoil or something. You can take Growth 3, uh, and then you can take, uh, let's see. Now we can go down to four there. You can take a couple points of fortune. And the reason why you do this is because, let me show you. The reason why you do this is because you want heroes. You have this hero, the Moth Seer, who is a multi-hero, which means they can spawn multiple times, and they start with Astral 2, Death 2. So they're very, very easy to, uh, you can use them to cast the Hollow Knight spell. Uh, your other heroes are also quite good. You have the Adventurer, Quirrell, who has Water 2, Astral 2, and Nature 2, as well as a lot of stealth. So, pretty good. You've got the Teacher, who is, eh, mainly an inspiring researcher. Like, that's the, uh, that's the good thing about her. You put her in a stack of mages, and she makes them all better researchers. And then you have the Mighty Knight, uh, Hegemol. Hegemol is pretty hilarious, honestly. He, he actually wears armor of knights, and has a maul. And he's got na he's just he's just got protection twenty nine and sixty hit points straight off the bat. So you slap a ring of regeneration on him, and he goes all day. He's hilarious. He's a he's a thug out of the box, um, and he's sacred. So you give him a bottle of holy water, and he has your bless, and then like you just you you laugh all the way to the bank because he is he's he's a solid he's a solid cat. So I would like. If you go Fortune 3, you don't necessarily need need to be able to cast the spell with your god. So, like, my inclination would be to do... Like, something like this would be quite viable, right? Have the Radiance with just a little bit of magic. The Radiance does not need magic to expand. Um, this does make the Radiance vulnerable to magic duels, so you have to keep it out of combat. But... It's a flyer with map move 22, so you can usually keep him out of combat if you don't want him fighting. If you want Astral 6, then what you can do is you can take that down and take like Astral 7 and take a Twist Fate Bless, which is kind of kind of neat. Or Astral 6 is all you need for that. I'll probably take 7 anyway. 
Twist Fate and minor, minor Magic Resistance. And then Attack Skill, Fire Resist, Inspirational Presence, that's actually pretty useful because you have all these Sacred Commanders. So Inspirational Presence will help you all pretty much all of your armies because you're leading your armies with Sacred Mages. Um, this would be a perfectly valid build. Um, the if you don't want if you want to go misfortune for the extra points, which is once again perfectly valid, then you can do this thing and have a uh, yeah you can go you can do that have a point of magic or something on him and then you can take like a really really heavy bless. Uh, larger is actually kind of hilarious, <clears throat> but you could take. Hard skin or fire shock resist. Fire shock resist is actually a great plus in this circumstance. That gives you another point of magic. And then you can take like minor major magic resistance. Let's see if we can take minor magic resistance as well. Yeah, minor magic resistance. There we go. And then some points of undying on your thugs just to make them last a little bit longer and be a nuisance. And then you can take regeneration. Now you can stat now you put a shroud on somebody or a bottle of holy water, they get all this out of one slot. And they can also stack a ring of regeneration on top of that to be just stupid about it. <clears throat> Excuse me, I got something in my throat. Um, beyond that, like I said, none of the options are really inspiring. I would probably go Demi Lich if I wanted to go Rainbow. Um uh, do the math, see if the Demi Lich is gonna work out as cheaper than the Crone or the Great Enchantress. Uh, Great Enchantress also gives you an extra pearl. So that could actually be a pretty solid choice. Let me see one, one second. Let me see if this works out cheaper. Seven, six. No, it doesn't, because then you have to pay for Dominion. So then you, need, then you need, like, you need to lose the scale if you do this. So in this case, you'd be paying... Oh, well, no, never mind. Works out just fine. So yeah, probably take a Great Enchantress if you want a Rainbow. And you can take her Dormant. And taking her Dormant means you don't actually even have to take terrible scales. Because you can, you can kick your scales up like that and be fine. Um, this is an option. <sighs> Those are probably the two options. Like, you could take an oracle, um, but the extra path cost will hurt you on a rainbow bless. Uh, you'd need to take a water bless then, because the regeneration would cost you the earth. Well, no, that's still functional, isn't it? You don't have the death, though. Yeah, the death would kill you. So yeah, I wouldn't really, I wouldn't necessarily take a an immobile here. It's either the Radiance or probably the Great Enchantress are the options. Um, but it's a very, very interesting nation. I'm not sure entirely how I'm going to play it. I know how expansion goes. Expansion goes really well. You recruit Great Sentries and you recruit Warrior Bugs. And the Warrior Bugs chaff for the Great Sentries. The Great Sentries kill to keep the Warrior Bugs from taking too many hits. Within a few a few provinces, that army is up to like two experienced stars, and everybody has 20 defense. It's ridiculous. They don't ever die, unless you run into a big pile of crossbows or something. But if you run into a big pile of archers, they have shields. They don't care about archers. Like, warrior bugs against archers effectively have 24 protection most of the time. Uh, great sentries? Pfft. Great sentries do not give a shit about archers. Um, so, against archers, you take a few warrior bug casualties and nobody cares. Uh, against crossbows, yeah, you'll be hurt more. Um, but even so, even against crossbows, great sentries are just thick enough to stand it most of the time. I mean, with the great shell and the, the armor and the high defense skill that they have with the shield parry, they're, like, crossbow bolts don't worry them all that much. They can plow through... A surprising number of crossbow bolts. Um, Moss Knights hate crossbow bolts. Moss Knights get murdered by crossbow bolts. So do Hollowness Lancers. If you have people who are lining up big lines of mages, big communions or something in the back, you can bring a bunch of Lancers for pretty cheap, because all your, all your troops are pretty cheap, and just dive bomb on them from behind. Um, there's so many options. You have many, many options to work with. And magically, your magic is not high level, but it's very diverse. The only thing that you have high level in is Astral. But you've got level 2 in fire, water, earth, and nature, which is all pretty solid. It says weak earth here, but that's a lie. Your earth is perfectly solid. You've got earth 2 and you've got earth communions. Um, and you've got a tiny, tiny little bit of death. And a tiny, tiny little bit of death is pretty handy. So, uh, thoughts. Things to think about. Um, I think it's a very interesting mod. 
just from glancing and doing a few expansion tests, it looks like it's pretty well balanced. I've been playing in the Middle Age, of course, and this was originally designed to be an early age nation. In the early age, I almost think it would be a little overpowered. Um, because in the early age, there is not a whole lot that can stop great centuries. I mean, giants can, but giants usually won't hit great centuries, and they'll get hit and carved up pretty quickly. Um, great centuries are very, very good. In the Middle Age, like I said, I think they're pretty well balanced so far. Obviously, they have no archers. They have no ranged units whatsoever, but you can recruit independent archers. It's not a hardship because you end up with quite a bit of money because your warrior bugs have almost no upkeep. Like, they're practically slave level upkeep. Um, great sentries are pretty expensive to upkeep, but it's not bad. I mean, they cost about the same as four or five warrior bugs. And most of your mages are sacred, so they're not spending a whole lot on upkeep. Your most expensive mage is the Soul Twister, and it's not all that expensive. You can afford to have a bunch of these cats around without worrying about it too much. Um, so, yeah, it's a, it's an interesting nation, and I'm really looking forward to playing it. Tell me your thoughts. Tell me what you think about it. Um, Herod of Lost is obviously looking for feedback. My feedback is, I think it's a solid nation, and we'll see how those thugs work in the late game. I think that basically is your late game, is spamming... Uh, teleporter thugs and immobile thugs and dropping anti-magic in every fight because you need it because your national magic resistance is garbage and yeah I think it's going to be a very very interesting game so thanks for watching guys and I will see you all in the next one and we'll look forward to this game going live take care